Well, by the time you get to my age, if you're anything like me, you'll have done many a lousy job, for lousy pay, and at unsocial hours. But, despite what I've done, I've never ever worked in a prison, and I have absolutely no intention of changing that in the future either. And with very good reason, if today's story is anything to go by. Another fantastic one from Dr. Creepen's vault. We really are spoiled at the moment. So, my dear friends, it's time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink. But only after this brief but exciting announcement. Stay tuned, everyone. We're talking Vikings War of Clans. Inspired by those famous strategy and RPG games of the 90s. Oh, I remember Command and Conquer. And I loved it in a way that you youngsters will never understand. What makes Vikings World so addictive is that more than 20 million online players are constantly changing the way the game evolves. Now, support my channel by downloading Vikings for free only from my links in the description. And get the special bonus 200 gold coins and a protective shield. Don't forget to look me up and join my Vikings clan under my nickname, Dr. Creepen. Being a corrections officer is a tough job. I'm sure you already knew that, but I guarantee you it's worse than what you've heard. For every story you've heard about guards being spat on, I've got six or seven of prisoners biting me. One was HIV positive, which led to a scare that I was infected. I've also helped extract unruly inmates more times than I can track. One threw feces at us. Well, that's what happens when you have to force an uncooperative prisoner to come out of the cell. So, well, we're used to it. Doesn't make me any less desperate for a shower afterwards, though. But we've all had our more horrific stories. What I'm about to tell you is the worst I have had. I was working at a maximum security prison at the time. You know the type. It's not quite supermax like you find in Florence, Colorado. That's the only federal supermax prison, and it's also where so many bombers have lived. It's actually called Bombers Row. Such people as Ramsey Youssef and the Unabomber still live there, as did Timothy McVeigh up until his execution. Maximum security is similar. The prisoners are kept under very high levels of security, with their own cells and only being allowed out for a certain amount of time a day. The difference is the sheer amount of solitary confinement the inmates get. With Supermax, it's long-term and intensive, with little to no contact with other humans. Inmates are often there indefinitely, and the administration has ample authority to punish and manage prisoners. There's little opportunity for prisoner grievances being addressed, or outside review of officer conduct. And the inmates can forget about having much in the way of education or recreation. That's why I find Supermax a bit cruel. That's not to say there aren't times for it, or people who need to be there. But I personally find it a bit much. That doesn't make maximum security a picnic, though. Maximum security inmates might have more contact with outsiders, but outside their cells, they're often in restraints and being escorted by guards or locked in a cage for recreation time. The high walls topped with razor wire and armed guards in observation towers just reinforce the point. I mastered the art of resting bitch face very quickly and made sure there was bite behind my bark. Well, that's the type of prison I was working at. I distinctly remember the day it started. It was actually pretty normal, or as normal as you can get with maximum security. We had to shoot an unruly inmate with beanbags, which is never pleasant. It basically means the cell block or recreation yard is locked down until the prisoner is subdued and on the way to the prison's supermax unit. Which, by the way, every prison has. It's just called the hole. I still had a headache after it all passed, which was half ready to turn into a migraine with how much the air stank. At least, there was only one more inmate who needed escorting back to his cell. The sound of clanking metal made me and my partner turn our heads. Metal upon concrete always has a distinctive sound, and it also has a certain sight, which is why I scrunched my forehead 
I didn't see any signs of metal hitting the cement floor. I jerked my head up when I saw something black and red. It almost looked like a face from a photo of an MRI scan. I continued looking around, as did my partner, only to find nobody left on the yard. Want to make some music, officer? The prisoner asked, and then smiled like he just proudly evicted a suicide widow. My partner and I just rolled our eyes and tightened his restraints. Behavior like that was always expected from that particular prisoner, especially towards women. The only good news is, annoying comments and the occasional dumb prank was the extent of it. It's not like we saw exactly what made the clank either, and then we put him back in his cell where he belonged. For a while, it was business as usual. One of the inmates had to go to work in the prison's license plate shops, so we got him escorted there. Another inmate had taken up residence in the block, which meant putting him in a cell. It was only 15 minutes later when the screaming started. Normally, screams don't mean too much in maximum security. After you've been on the job long enough, you learn the different types of screams. The screams that indicate a fight is about to start are the ones that start quiet and then become loud. A distressed scream starts out loud and doesn't get any quieter. A fellow officer and I were in the control room when it started. The place in the cell block that can open and close all the doors, see the entire ward, and so on. We needed to report to our immediate supervisor for some details about some new arrivals who'd soon be in the block. I looked up from the papers I was given, and immediately noticed something about one of the inmates. At first, I couldn't tell what he was doing. It looked like... <laughs> Kind of like, well, he was trying out ballet dance, but what kind of self-respecting maximum security inmate does that? Maximum security is only one step below supermax. People go to there because of how violent they are, or they could be. I nudged my partner and supervisor. We couldn't help but stare. My eyes scrunched when I noticed that the arm movements appeared to be picking up momentum. I started walking towards the cell. His arms quickly started flailing around even more. My heart soon started pounding. I didn't even get to move forward two steps before the man started screaming. I could have sworn his lungs would burst with how loud it was. My boss called for backup as we approached the cell. As soon as I looked in the cell, I inhaled sharply. His skin was turning purple. In between screams that by now were becoming strangled, he panted hard and desperately was seeking to get some air, and he was squirming and arching his back. Inmate A054551, stop screaming, I ordered, not knowing what else to do. He kept screaming as if he didn't hear me. The fact that his legs started kicking violently only made me jump. My colleagues and I couldn't do much, except just look at each other. I grabbed my radio and asked for the door to be opened. And then, all at once, he collapsed. We managed to get into the cell, but it was already too late. His heart had already stopped. Our backup finally arrived, and they called medical while we tried reviving him with CPR. Not that it was going to work with how grey the inmate was already getting. We gave our statements about what had happened, and I don't think I need to detail just how shaken the whole bunch of us were. He was only five foot ten, but it looked like he was suddenly a foot taller. And yet, there was nothing near the cell door that he could have been standing on. Even if there was, he didn't have any rope. We already did a random check of the cells that morning, and we also checked the cell after we'd removed the body. There wasn't even a rope in the process of being made. A couple of my co-workers mentioned something. They all thought they saw something red and black, reminding them of an MRI face photo floating around. Nobody could really get a good look, since it was just in the corner of their eyes. 
I still half-heartedly regret looking up what an MRI face photo looks like. The glowing eye sockets are the least of it. The gaping blackness where the mouth and nose should be reminded me of vampires and zombies. If it was only one incident, chances are the prison might have even forgotten about it. But the very next week, another prisoner on my block died in the same manner. And then it happened again, two days after that. The first two inmates it happened to were known troublemakers, but the third guy was an inmate who barely caused any trouble in the first place. A guy who made everyone puzzled as to why he was even in maximum security in the first place. That was all it took for it to become a regular occurrence. It quickly became a well-known thing across the prison. Everyone swapped stories after work. Some of us even told our families. As we came to find out, though, we didn't know everything, as we soon learned when the inmates began talking during recreation time. For all the tight security measures, inmates still managed to interact with each other, and rumors quickly started up, especially on the recreation yard. I finally saw them, one said. The ones with red skin and only eyes for features. I saw them. I and my colleagues just looked at each other. What did that even mean? Humans don't have only eyes for facial features. I just had to ask an inmate as we escorted him back to his cell. Oh, you mean the Red Faces? Apparently they already had a name. The Red Faces were these beings with red skin that lived in the walls of the prison, and they had purely black eyes and no other facial features. Where there should have been a mouth or a nose, grooves of skin had replaced them. As soon as I heard that, it all made sense. Though, I'm not entirely sure how seriously everybody took it at first. Some inmates tried telling us there was a red face behind us. Some of the newbies fell for it, which made the prisoners and veteran officers alike laugh. The jokes about the red faces started spilling over into our office duty hours. One day... After pulling into my usual parking spot, I put on a red mask with black eye sockets on it and snuck up on my boss. Oh, he was pissed. But with my fellow officers watching and laughing their asses off, there wasn't much he could do. Eventually, he gave in and chuckled as well. But he did say one thing that would come to haunt me. Oh, that's going to get us in a lot of trouble. I hope you know that. In the moment, nobody thought much of it, but then he walked into the prison for our shift. We all got our pre-shift briefing, and learned, and learned what someone had done during the night. Someone thought they saw a red face with no nose or mouth that looked like the MRI face photo when it happened. One of the night officers insisted he'd seen the same thing. With violence in the prison lower during the night... It took everyone by surprise when the screams of distress came from the cell. And then they got to the cell and opened it. The inmate's organs had burst from his abdomen. His small intestines draped over the toilet. Oh, just thinking about that makes my calf muscles clench. Right away I felt bad about pranking my supervisor. But then, during that single shift... We had four more attacks on prisoners from the Red Faces. I was in the control room when three of them happened. As for the fourth, I was standing right next to the cell when the attack began. And I must say, there's nothing quite like being right next to the cell to realize the descriptions of the Red Faces were true. The fact that I was standing right there and could get a good look inside the cell probably saved the man's life especially since I could respond immediately. As soon as I saw inside the cell, I inhaled. It wasn't just the face that I saw, which really did look like an MRI face photo. No, the chest also looked like an MRI photo, albeit much too narrow. And then it made eye contact with me. By the time the cell door fully opened, the thing was gone. None of our supervisors believed us. Not me, 
not my colleagues, not even my boss, who was watching in the control room. The administration simply did not believe us. Instead, they threatened to fire us if we ever mentioned the red faces to them again. That didn't keep us from listening to what the inmates had to say about it, though. Most of the inmates appreciated that, and there was even a slight reduction in how much of a fight they put up if their tempers fled, which everyone considered an improvement. Not that that made anyone feel better. By then, even a couple of the guards had found themselves raised off the ground and choked. They didn't die, but they did quit right after they'd given their statements. Before they left, they gave us a warning. The red faces were changing. Beforehand, their contours were round, like we were used to seeing, even if it was still out of the corners of our eyes, but now they were becoming sharper and more angular. And then came the moment that changed everything. Yet another inmate had been attacked by a red face. We managed to restart his heart, and he regained consciousness just in time for the prison superintendent to arrive with EMTs. As soon as the superintendent arrived, his eyes bulged. He took a step or two back, and he even started swaying. I think someone had to help him stay steady on his feet, but that didn't keep him from shaking, and shaking hard. Even his breathing started to get shaky. It didn't even make sense. This was the same man who'd shouted like he was R. Lee Ernie's alter ego. Every time he had to deal with inmates on a regular basis, he yelled at them. His favorite insult being, yeah, Go fight a rainbow, you plumpy platypus. He yelled that whether you were fat or thin. We tried explaining what we'd seen, but he shut us all down and told us to shut up. And then the inmate was taken to the hospital. The next day, right before the start of shift, we learned that the inmate had died during the night. The prison superintendent got up on the podium. It was so silent, I could hear someone in the back of the room scratching their arm. And then the superintendent spoke. I've heard reports people have been giving about red-skinned faces with only eyes on their faces. I'm tired of this nonsense. You are corrections officers, not hillbillies. From now on, any reports of these beings will result in the office involved being terminated. Any inmates who report instances of them are to be regarded as a danger to self and others. If you fail to do so, you will be terminated. You will also be terminated if you discuss these beings with the inmates or each other. That day, six officers on my block alone were fired because they mentioned the red faces in passing. Two of the inmates on my block got sent to the hole for the same reason. We couldn't even look the inmates in the eye after that. The level of resistance from the inmates spiked, and it stayed there. Many took to mutilating themselves to escape. But once they were released from the medical unit or the hospital, they simply found themselves in the hole instead of being transferred to another prison like they wanted. The only ones who succeeded in escaping the red faces are the ones who committed suicide. Every time that happened, we seemed to hear what sounded like a cow laughing, which only made me wonder if suicide was much of an improvement. After the superintendent's announcement, more prisoners were being killed, as many as two a day. We noticed that we were all becoming more and more short of breath, and it was obvious why. More people were being fired than they were being hired at that point. Two months after the superintendent had made the announcement, we started finding the shanks, prison talk for handmade knives. Inmates started attacking officers, leading to privileges being taken away and being moved to the hole. The attacks lasted for months, on top of the red faces killing the inmates. I was lucky. I was only attacked twice. I don't consider that solace, though. Both incidents required stitches. The inmate who attacked me was perhaps the one who resisted more often than anyone else, which is probably what caused him to be transferred to an actual super max prison. And that caused more inmates to start attacking us. But 
of all of them, he was the only one who succeeded. At that, the inmates seemed to have permanent scowls on their faces. I don't think anyone doubted that something was coming. And then, it happened. I was halfway through my shift when four inmates found themselves under attack. With so many officers gone, nobody seemed to have a chance to rest before the next attack happened. In fact, when one attack was still underway, another started, forcing a couple of officers to investigate while the rest of us handled the first one. We had to break protocol. There wasn't an officer in the control room, and the inmates noticed that. One of them managed to reach the control room, and managed to open the doors to the other cells. I was busy with another inmate, so I don't know exactly what happened. My eyes bulged when the inmates suddenly surged forward. It was like I was in the middle of the running of the bulls. I couldn't move. I didn't even know where I was supposed to look, or what to look at. For that matter, I couldn't even control how much my eyes were blinking. All at once... A sledgehammer feeling rocketed through my back. The taste of iron swirled around in my mouth, my lower jaw shooting arrows of pain through my face. My breaths were soaring in and out. I don't know if I groaned or not, but I do know I was squirming. Despite the pain pinching my body, I managed to look up. I only got a few glimpses, but I noticed my colleagues falling to the ground. Some of the inmates had started kicking them, one stomped on an officer's head in a swift drop kick. The foot might as well have been an axe. The bone might as well have been a tree trunk whose last stand had finally given out. My breathing started to hurt as soon as I saw that. And then there were the footsteps, or oh, more like a pounding. The floor shook so hard I almost thought the prison was collapsing on top of me. Stomach acid lurched into my mouth, and onto the floor as doors slammed and metal tore. And then, I heard something. I haven't heard anything quite like it before or since. At first it reminded me of an entire herd of cows mooing, but it soon mixed with a didgeridoo from Australian Aboriginal cultures. And then, all at once, I saw them. Giant spindly legs reminding me of the sewing spindle from Sleeping Beauty, only much longer. I didn't understand how they could even function like that. They were much too thin to support any sort of weight, and yet they pounded harder and faster than an industrial printer. But more than that, they were black with red stripes going up the sides. At that point, I was so dizzy, I forgot I was on the ground. I shook my head in an effort to get my bearings, but it wouldn't go away. The only thing I succeeded in doing was making myself so nauseous I threw up right where I was. One of the faces paused and loomed over me, and then, before I could do anything about it, it stomped on my hip, and everything went black. I don't know how long I was lying on the floor, passed out. When I came to, I thought I heard the bang of some sort of projectile being fired. I even thought I heard the sound of a beanbag hitting skin. It didn't matter. I still coughed from the tear gas lingering in the air. Standing up after that was a difficult task, as I might as well have been moving in molasses. My hips and lower legs hurt. My left wrist looked broken, but I still managed to stand up. I'm not entirely sure how, though. My limbs were so heavy and my muscles so tight. My abdomen cramped up at one point, and a starburst or two went off in my eyes. The copper taste in my mouth still lingered. And then I looked at the floor, and sharply inhaled. The first thing I saw was a hand lying at my feet. A hand severed from the wrist. The tendons, bone, and ligaments reminding me of spaghetti. I kept looking around. Organs and body parts were hanging off the stairs, and the furniture inside the cells, even off the hinges of the cell doors. 
some of the organs decorating the place were human intestines, the blood redder than the nose of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Chunks of brain matter and bone chips littered the floor. A white substance that I later learned was human nerve smeared the place. Slices of human liver lay on a couple of surfaces like paperweights. The blood might as well have been turned into paint. Oh, and it was silent. The only things to be heard were my breathing, my footsteps stepping in blood, and the occasional drip onto the floor. I almost collapsed when I saw a team of officers in the windows of the control room. Maybe they were too shocked to see me being alive and standing to be able to register right away, or maybe they'd only just arrived. But as soon as I almost collapsed, they jumped to my side. As if they were statues and me collapsing was the only way to make them capable of moving again. What's your name? One of them asked. Janet Fitzroy, I croaked out, though it all sounded so distant. I wasn't the only survivor that day, but there weren't many of us. I couldn't bring myself to care that the inmates killed the prison superintendent, much less that he had been decapitated. His spinal cord ripped clean out of his spine and draped over his desk lamp like a Christmas garland. It did get to me, though, that my boss was dead. It wasn't just that. It was also how they found him. His nose had been sliced clean off and his mouth had been sewn shut. For days afterwards, I remained dazed. Investigators interviewed me, though I'm not sure they really believed me. When the media got wind of the red faces, not even turning off the news could make them stop. I had to file a restraining order just to get some peace and quiet. That didn't stop me from learning one more detail, though. Dozens of inmates and officers were dead, and had had their organs removed but only a few of them were found like my boss was, their mouths sewn shut and their noses gone. But beyond that, they'd also had their eyeballs ripped out, leaving nothing but empty eye sockets. The state governor personally visited me and the other surviving officers. She hugged me, I remember, and gave her condolences over what had happened. We all received leave with full pay. Well, I never set foot in that prison again. In time, nobody would be able to visit it without also committing trespassing. The governor announced that, once the investigation was complete and the scene processed, the prison would be permanently decommissioned. The surviving inmates were relocated to other prisons. Most of the surviving officers, myself included, found work at other prisons, after our doctors gave us a clean bill of health. Not all of us lived long enough to regain our health, though. I attended two funerals for those who died of self-inflicted shotgun wounds to the head. Like I said at the beginning, being a corrections officer is one tough job. Ask any one of us, and there are things we just don't like repeating to others. And that's... One story I really don't like repeating. So, why am I? <laughs> the answer is simple. Last week I got a phone call from someone who worked with an old co-worker of mine. Any annoyance I had at dinner being interrupted vanished when I answered the phone. Is this Janet Fitzroy? The voice on the other end of the line asked. As soon as I heard the shaking voice, my stomach sank. My name is Lucas Somerset. I work at a prison in Albany. I heard you worked at that prison where the massacre happened. That immediately got me still. I already knew what he was going to say. Those things the media described. Those red faces. Oh, I didn't think they were real until we all saw them. Four of our inmates have been found strangled to death. They've all been found with their noses severed and their mouths sewn shut. Whoa, that 
that one was pretty intense, wasn't it? What did you make of that? Oof. Now, I told you at the beginning, I'm not ever likely to work in a prison. And that has just confirmed my opinion. Well, tell me what you thought in the comments below the video. And as ever, I will do my best to reply and have a bit of a chit-chat with you all. Now, it's Friday evening, so go on. Get out there and have some fun. I will be back with you again on Monday. But for now, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>